So I'm going to start my fifth lecture, which is on Weidman Staten Ferret. And we are at an exciting stage in our learning because at the end of this lecture, I will show you something really surprising about the behavior of uh, the phase transformations that we have considered so far in steels. So the lecture is about Weidman Staten Ferret today. And the origin of the term Weidman Staten Ferret comes from Alvar de Wiedmannstaden, who was looking at this uh, particular meteorite at the Imperial Porcelain Works in Vienna. And uh, this is not the Ra Radshina uh, meteorite, but another one that I saw in the Smithsonian Museum in uh, Washington. And this is what its structure looks like, this huge, massive. Uh, so this is, of course, uh, a very coarse scale, very, very large plates which seem to be arranged on the octahedral planes of the austenite and this is an iron nickel alloy which cools at an incredibly slow rate uh, when it's uh, traversing the universe you know um, it would take about a million years to cool down by one degree centigrade and that's why we have these extremely coarse structures inside the meteorite and then, uh, you know, Osmond, who is uh, one of the fathers of metallography, uh, he noticed similar patterns at the head of a steel ingot. And that's how the name Weidmann Staten Ferrite became adopted. And there's a very big difference between these plates and the sort of Weidmann Staten Ferrite uh, that we see in steels. I mean, these are very, very small scales, uh, both optical micrographs. We see parallel formations of uh, plates coming from uh, a thin layer of ferrite at the austenite grain boundary. Uh, and here's another picture, which was kindly given to me by Ronaldo at the Pontifical Catholic University of Peru when I visited Peru. The important point I want you to note here is that these plates are all in the same crystallographic orientation space because they've come from the same segment of the austenite grain boundary. So here, all these are in the same crystallographic orientation in space. And that may not be good for mechanical properties such as toughness, because although the plates themselves are, you know, a few micrometers thick, we have uh, not much a variation in crystallography across the packet of plates. And Pickering, back in 1967, uh, said, you know, that a cleavage facet, when you break the steel in a brittle manner, the cleavage facet corresponds to the distance between large misorientation boundaries that force a crack to deflect. So if you have clusters of plates which are all in the same orientation, then they will not deflect cracks. And this was in 1967 when he explained how uh, crystallography plays a role in cleavage. And then uh, electron backscatter diffraction became uh, a, a readily available technique. And Anne-Francois Gauge, who was a PhD student of Harvey Flower and Trevor Lindley at Imperial College, uh, did some classic work which demonstrated that when we look uh, by scanning electron microscopy or optical microscopy, and we see a particular grain size. That is not the important grain size when it comes to cleavage fracture, but the crystallographic grain size. So each of these colored regions actually has structure inside them, but from the point of view of cleavage crack deflection, this is your crystallographic grain size. So if you want to correlate toughness, uh, in, in brittle fracture against a crystallography, then you have to look at the crystallographic grain size. So these two pieces of work are really quite important because they, uh, they essentially prove that when you have clusters of plates in the same orientation, they do very little to deflect the crack. Whereas if you can generate plates in many different orientations, then the crack is frequently deflected and therefore you absorb more energy in fracture. Okay, 
So we've considered martensite and a-thermal martensite forming below a particular martensite start temperature. Uh, we've looked at lower bainite and upper bainite, both of which form below the T0 temperature. And Weedman statin ferrite actually can form above the T0 temperature. Okay, so it isn't a transformation uh, that can uh, that can form without a composition change. There has to be a chemical composition change for Weedman statin ferrite to form. So uh, this is the Weedman statin start temperature, the bainite start temperature, and the martensite start temperature. Now. It's still forming at a relatively low temperature. And in one of the first lectures, I explained that you need atomic mobility before you can get a, a diffusional transformation such as ferrite or perlite. And Weedman Sun ferrite does not have that atomic mobility uh, at the temperatures where it forms. But nevertheless, its chemical composition cannot be the same as that of the austenite from which it grows. But it is possible to have a displacive transformation. Let's say this is our austenite, and these are the carbon atoms and the iron atoms, and a particular unit cell of crystallography. Then you can get a displacive transformation as far as the large atoms are concerned. But these species, which are in interstitial sites, can be partitioned so you can notice this is free from carbon and the carbon has increased in concentration here. And as the Weedmann-Staden ferrite becomes thicker, you put more carbon into the austenite and this region has zero carbon. So you can alter the crystallography by a displacive transformation with all the characteristics of a shear strain, strain energy, and so on. Uh, and if you had substitutional solutes like manganese, there would not be partitioning between the parent and product phases. So this would be a displacive transformation that is controlled by the rate at which the carbon can diffuse away from the interface. So this is a diffusion, carbon diffusion controlled displacive transformation. And another way of illustrating this is, let's imagine that uh, we have a queue of soldiers here. Okay, in a particular sequence identified by these numbers. And they board a military transport. Uh, you can still identify that this particular soldier came from this location in the queue. In other words, there is an atomic correspondence between the parent and the product crystals. And there'll be a lot of strain energy because they are forced to sit in the same sequence as in the queue, even though number three might like to sit next to number five. So this is a description of the martensitic transformation. Now, if you look at a reconstructive transformation, where we have a queue of civilians waiting at the bus stop, and the bus arrives and they all rush without uh, respect for each other onto the bus, and we've lost atomic correspondence completely, and they're sitting next to their friends, and therefore the strain energy here is not as high as with martensite, but we've lost all atomic correspondence. Now, there is a third kind of transformation. So this is a civilian transformation, and this was a military transformation. This is what we call paramilitary, where we have small atoms here who, when the bus comes along, they just rush onto the bus, ignoring you know, the sequence in the queue, uh, whereas the large atoms move in a disciplined manner. So we have an atomic correspondence as far as the large atoms are concerned, but the carbon uh, reaches a location where it has the lowest free energy. So it diffuses during a paramilitary transformation, but the large atoms do not. Now, there are two kinds of weedman certain ferrite. Uh, those which start from a pre-existing layer of electromorphic ferrite here, this is grown by diffusional transformation during cooling. And these plates simply start off with the orientation of the ferrite, which has a good orientation relationship with the austenite, not the other side, which does not have the uh, orientation relationship. And the second kind is primary Wittgenstein ferrite, which nucleates directly from the austenite grain boundary. And if there are 
nucleating from the same austenite grain boundary segment, then they will tend to grow in the same direction. Okay? There's no fundamental difference otherwise between secondary and primary weed and ferrite. Now notice that I've drawn these diagrams uh, so that the color of the weed and ferrite is the same as that of the ferrite which grows at high temperatures. And that is absolutely the case when you look at micrographs. So this is etching white compared with the perlite around it. This is the micrograph I showed you of bainite. It's on a, a similar scale. Yeah. So this is a micrograph of bainite, which I showed you is on a similar scale as this micrograph. But the bainite is etching dark compared with this. And I explained to you that the bainite etches dark because there is fine structure inside what appears to be a single plate is actually thousands of small platelets with uh, intervening phases such as carbides or austenite. Here, this is completely clean. Okay, so there is no structure inside the plate of weedmus and ferrite. It etches white just like the ferrite which forms at high temperatures. Now, just to show you the displacements associated with the um, uh, formation of weedmus and ferrite. This is uh, austenite, which has been polished uh, organically flat, and we are transforming at a temperature where you would induce weedmus and ferrite to grow. And what you will see is the development of displacements as a surface as the plate grows slowly across the boundary. So this is not like martensite. Uh, these are growing at a rate controlled by the diffusion of carbon in the austenite ahead of the interface. I'm just going to stop the video here. Yeah, so if you look at this plate here uh, of Edmund Sandfarad, we started from this corner and has now reached the other end. You can see dark contrast on one side and bright contrast on the other. And if you look carefully, the same applies to all of these plates. And if we do more careful measurements, as were done by uh, Watson and McDougall back in 1973, then the displacement produced is like a tent. Okay, You can see the deflection of scratches produce a tent. So it's actually two plates growing at the same time. Okay? And the reason for this will become clear shortly. So just to summarize, um, weedman sand ferrite can grow at small undercoolings uh, well above the T0 temperature. So there's no question that carbon must partition. So carbon diffusion is essential during transformation. So this is a displacive transformation whose growth rate is controlled by the diffusion of carbon uh, in the austenite ahead of the interface. And the weedman sand ferrite never has an excess of carbon beyond that required by equilibrium or para-equilibrium, I should say, where the substitutional atoms don't move. Now, with, uh, uh, with a displacive transformation, this is the basic shape deformation that you should observe, a shear and a volume change normal to that. But what we are seeing is actually a displacement like this, where you have two plates growing together and accommodating each other's shear deformation. And in this way, they minimize the strain energy associated with the transformation, okay? because one plate compensates for the other plate. But what it means is that, you know, if you have a, a particular shape deformation and a particular habit plane, then you also have a particular variant of the orientation relationship. So these two plates will not be in exactly the same crystallographic orientation, but we should be able to see a low misorientation boundary between the two plates. Uh, so they have different variants of the habit plane, 558 approximately and 585 approximately, and therefore they must have different crystallography, it cannot be in exactly identical orientation. And indeed, when we do transmission electron micros microscopy, you can see in a, what appears optically to be a single plate, a very coarse plate uh, is actually two fairly coarse plates 
with a low misorientation between the two sides. Now, you might ask, why doesn't martensite or why doesn't bainite grow by this mechanism? Because they can cancel out each other's strain energy approximately. Well, the reason is there is a cost. There is a cost in growing two plates together. And that is that you have to simultaneously nucleate the correct two plates, which will accommodate each other's shape deformation. And that is unlikely compared with the nucleation of single plates. So you greatly reduce the nucleation rate. And that means that you get a coarse microstructure. And a coarse microstructure is not good for toughness. So very often in, for example, well deposits and so on, we try to avoid witness and ferret. And I'll show you how to do that. So now I'm going to go into the theory of the growth rate of Wiedmannstein ferrite. So supposing that we are transforming at a particular temperature T, then the compositions of the Wiedmannstein ferrite at the interface will be given by the equilibrium phase boundary here, which separates the ferrite phase field from the austenite plus ferrite and the austenite phase field. So this is our, what's known as the AE1 curve and the AE3 curves. C bar is our average concentration, and that is the corresponding equilibrium composition of the austenite, which is in contact with the ferrite. So this is called a tie line. Okay? And we expect that because the ferrite has a lower carbon concentration than the austenite at the interface, so this is the composition of the austenite at the interface and the composition of the ferrite at the interface. We will accumulate carbon in the austenite ahead of the interface. And C bar is the average carbon concentration. And we'll assume that doesn't change. The far field concentration is not affected. This is a diffusion distance because I'm approximating an error function by a straight line here. It should strictly be a smooth curve like this, which follows an error function behavior. And Z star is the position of the alpha gamma interface. So let's, uh, let's uh, look at that profile again. When that profile advances at the Wiesman sudden ferrite grows, we have to get rid of that much carbon from the region at the interface, if this is to remain constant. If we are to maintain local equilibrium at the interface, that means this concentration and this concentration, then this carbon has to be taken away from the interface. And the rate at which we are accumulating this carbon in the austenite is simply given by, you know, this concentration minus this concentration multiplied by the increment in thickness here, yeah? of the in increment in the length of the weakness and ferrite and divide by the time interval in which that increment happens. In other words, this is the lengthening rate of the weakness and ferrite. And this is the amount of solute that must be partitioned into the austenite as the interface advances. And if it continues to partition, then we will lose local equilibrium. So that has to be carried away by diffusion along this gradient. And that diffusion flux is simply given by Fix's law, where we have a diffusion coefficient and the gradient and the minus sign is simply because this gradient is negative, whereas Z is in the positive direction. Now these two quantities, the rate of partitioning and the rate at which the solid is taken away from the interface by diffusion must be equal, right? So these must be equal in order to maintain the compositions at the interface to be consistent with the phase diagram. And because I've assumed a, a straight line here, we can express this part as simply the diffusion coefficient uh, divided by this concentration minus this concentration over delta Z, okay? So C gamma alpha minus C bar divided by delta Z. Okay, so as the plate advances, it's leaving carbon behind the tip, okay? So we are not actually increasing 
this distance here because the carbon is being left behind as the plate advances. So the diffusion distance delta Z, which, which was in the previous uh, slide here, is constant. Okay, this is not a flat interface where you just accumulate carbon ahead of the interface, but this is a curved plate, and this distance remains constant because you're leaving the carbon behind as the plate grows. Now, there is another problem. Um, so we have here the rate at which solute is partitioned and the rate at which it's taken away by diffusion. And when I rearrange this equation and replace dz star by dt by the lengthening rate of the plate, we end up with this equation here. And I said to you that delta z does not change as the plate lengthens, and we approximate that by the radius of the plate tip. So it's the diffusion coefficient divided by the radius of the plate tip multiplied by this concentration term. So we have the lengthening rate as a function of these parameters. Now, of course, uh, we don't know the tip radius. So the problem is not solved. Yeah, we only have the velocity as a function of the tip radius. And when I plot the lengthening rate versus the plate tip radius, it doesn't make sense. I have to pick a particular radius along this curve. And what this indicates is that the velocity would be greatest if the tip radius decreased indefinitely. And that, that also doesn't make sense. So we are not taking account of something. Something is missing from this analysis. And that something is to do with the curvature of the interface, okay, curvature. Curvature itself changes equilibrium at the interface. So if, if you think about a cylinder, uh, this is the shape of a Wiedmann-Stein ferrite. It's uh, what we call a parabolic cylinder. So you take a parabola and you extend it along this direction uh, with the distance L here. Uh, if I put a cylinder here of radius R and length L, then as, as the plate evolves, as the plate evolves, there is a, a creation of interfacial area. And that creation of interfacial area is a cost that we must take into account. Now, the rate, uh, the rate at which the area, the surface area of the cylinder increases with radius is, you know, basically uh, 2 pi r, which is circumference times the length, and we differentiate that with respect to r, you get 2 pi l. And similarly, we can calculate dv by dr, the volume of the cylinder as a function of the tip radius. Uh, basically, um, pi r squared times l, differentiate that, and we end up with 2 pi r l. So the way in which the area changes with the volume and the radius is simply uh, this divided by this, and we get dA is equal to dV upon the radius. Now, this is a volume increment, and the smallest volume increment that we can have is if we add an atom to the plate. So I'm, I'm changing now to the volume per atom divided by R, this delta A, and the increase in free energy because of this increase in interfacial area is simply VA, the volume per atom divided by R, multiplied by the interfacial energy per unit area. Okay? So this is the cost that we haven't taken into account. And the fact is that if you simply calculate the free energy change from the uh, thermodynamics, this is the maximum, okay? But we have to remove the cost due to the creation of the interface. So this is the only free energy that's actually available to drive the transformation. And if we set this to be equal to zero, then we find a tip radius at which growth is not possible, right? So if I set this to zero, then I get the, the thermodynamic driving force related to a critical radius below which you cannot get any growth at all. So, the effective driving force by substitute for delta G uh, infinity over here is given by this equation, which when I rearrange is one minus the critical 
tip radius at which growth rate goes to zero divided by the tip radius. So we can scale the original equation that we derived by this term, which means uh, that we are reducing the driving force for growth according to the value of the tip radius relative to the critical radius. And when we do that, we get a new curve for the lengthening rate, which uh, here the growth rate goes to zero. There's a maximum value here. And as the tip radius becomes coarser and coarser, uh, you know, your diffusion becomes more and more difficult because you're partitioning more solute ahead of the tip and therefore the growth rate decreases. Now this gives us uh, an indication that look, maybe, okay, and this is not rigorous science, but maybe the plate chooses a tip radius which gives the maximum growth rate, okay? And when we compare experimentally measured growth rates for a large variety of uh, alloys, uh, steels, uh, against, uh, against the measured values, we get the same sort of linear behavior as expected from theory. In fact, the growth rate measured is slightly higher than the maximum that we calculate. Okay? But remember that we are making approximations like you know, parabolic uh, cylinder shape and, and so on. So this is pretty good. This is only a discrepancy about five micrometers per second. And we can summarize what we have learned so far that the mechanism of transformation is displacive, but carbon must partition during growth, and therefore it can form above the T0 temperature. And pairs of plates grow together to cancel out each other's strain energy, partly, and that is another reason why it can form at high temperatures, because the driving force available at high temperatures is not so large. Now, it is important to understand that Wiedemann-Sand ferrite also forms in interstitial free steels, all right? And in that case, the growth rate is simply controlled by the mobility of the interface. So it's very important to realize that plates of Wiedemann-Sand ferrite also grow in carbon-free alloys of iron, in which case the lengthening rate would be controlled by the mobility of the glissal transformation interface. And all that is discussed in my book on the theory of transformations in steels. But I want, I emphasize this because uh, there is a problem in the literature. Now, supposing that we look at the growth of dendrites, all right, in, in pure water, dendrites of ice in pure water, then the dendrite would look like this, almost like weedman sutton ferrite, okay? And the reason why, you know, the ice forms in water in dendritic form is that if you happen to have circumstances in which the liquid has a negative temperature gradient because, for example, you are evolving an enthalpy of solidification at the interface, then a small perturbation that you put on the interface will be advancing into undercooled liquid. So a flat interface would then become unstable and develop into this dendritic shape. And this has been, this kind of thing has been beautifully modeled by uh, phase field theory, okay? So this, for example, is a computer model of dendrite formation uh, in uh, a particular system. Uh, so dendrite, solid dendrites growing from uh, liquid. Okay, with some solid partitioning. And this was work done at Aachen University some time ago. And, you know, you, you basically put some seeds over here and started with a flat interface and it develops into, it, it becomes unstable and develops dendritic forms, okay? So obviously many people started to apply phase field theory to Friedman sudden ferrite. And it doesn't make any sense for a number of reasons. The first is that we can get Wiedmann-Stein ferrite without any diffusion, interstitial diffusion. So Wiedmann-Stein ferrite in interstitial free alloys, there would be no diffusion field to produce an undercooling and therefore to have uh, an interface instability. The second thing is that 
almost all the phase field models completely ignore the fact that the shape is determined by strain energy. Okay. Uh, and uh, finally, you know, um, in order to produce a shape, uh, the phase field models use ridiculous levels of anisotropy of interface energy. In other words, the shapes are not naturally produced, but by forcing on certain uh, anisotropy into the system. So um, here, for example, are all the alloys in which I have found Wiedemann-Sarden and ferrite forming in interstitial free uh, alloys. So this is a, a table I've taken from my book. And uh, these are high purity alloys containing no carbon. And the Wiedemann sand ferrite looks exactly the same as in uh, ordinary steels. So phase field modeling is not actually uh, relevant for Wiedemann sand ferrite because it completely ignores the mechanism of transformation and the fact that you can get Wiedemann sand ferrite in interstitial free alloys. Okay, so that's completes the story about Wiedemann Stein Ferret, but I want to finish by showing you something really exciting, is that how do, how does martensite, how does bainite, and how does Wiedemann Stein Ferret fit together, all right? So if I have a computer model uh, using all the information that we have learned so far, how can I predict all the aspects of the transformation behavior? So, this is a, a slide showing you, uh, first of all, the critical driving force needed to nucleate martensite. Okay, so uh, if you go back to my second lecture, I discussed that you should have a certain amount of free energy before martensite is triggered, and this is that free energy of the order of a thousand joules per mole, minus a thousand joules per mole. There is another curve here, which is if you are nucleating things isothermally. I haven't talked about this, but you can find it in this reference or in my book. So this is the minimum free energy that you need to nucleate Wiedemann-Stein ferrite or bainite. Wiedemann-Stein ferrite and bainite nucleate by the same mechanism. So if this is the driving force uh, for um, ferrite formation with the partitioning of carbon, you must exceed the stored energy of Wiedemann-Stein ferrite due to the strain before Wiedemann-Stein ferrite can form, and you must exceed uh, this dark curve in order for Wiedemann-Stein ferrite to nucleate. So that predicts the Wiedemann-Stein start temperature. And in the case of uh, bainite, again, you must exceed the stored energy and you must be able to nucleate. But if you can nucleate Wiedemann-Stein ferrite, you can nucleate bainite. Okay. And you need to go to much greater undercooling to form martensite. Okay. Now, what this uh, model predicts is not just uh, a prediction of transformation temperatures, but supposing that now I added alloying elements to steel A, then in this case, because I have to undercool so much before nucleation becomes possible, you do not get Wiedemann-Staten ferrite. So in this steel, you would never get Wiedemann-Staten ferrite. You only get bainite and martensite. And if I alloy even more, even the bainite transformation disappears. I only get martensite because martensite can form before bainite can form. Okay. So this is an uh, this is the uh, highly unusual prediction that we made in 1981 that you will not find all three phases in all steels, and there are a lot of experiments. Uh, already published and uh, published in the context of this theory, which prove that. So, for example, uh, here is uh, a 0 0.1 carbon and two manganese alloy, in which we are systematically increasing the manganese concentration. As we do that, uh, of course, we don't get any Wiedemann-Staden ferrite, but as we increase the nickel concentration, the bainite star temperature moves towards the martensite temperature and eventually completely disappears. And this has been experimentally verified. So uh, for this specific alloy system, uh, you can find this on my uh, we uh, website if you look for Hong Suk Yang and uh, Padisha. So the idea 
that all three phases form in all alloys is not actually correct. It depends on the specific driving force for your alloy. If the driving force is very small, you will only get martin size. So for example, for an iron 30 nickel alloy, you do not get anything except martin size. Okay, it transforms at uh, cryogenic temperatures to martensite, but nothing happens at high temperatures. And for a nine chrome 0.1 carbon steel of the type that's used in power plant, you only get bainite and martensite. You never get weedmistite and ferrite. Okay, so to finish off this lecture, you know, I've combined everything that we've learned in the last five lectures. Uh, to show you how all the transformations fit together. And all these ideas are available in a computer program called MUCG46, which you can download on my website to do calculations of these transformation temperatures, etc. So I will stop there today, and um, I'll be happy to answer any questions. My question is, uh, when we are producing commercial steels with the rate of cooling uh, in a normal rolling mill, is possible to, to get uh, this with, uh, with Manhattan uh, structure in, in any case? Mm -hmm. And how it affects uh, mechanical properties of the steel if, 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 if it's formed? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, so so in a later lecture, uh, after we have covered uh, the formation of uh, ferrite and perlite, uh, I will explain how to how to deal with continuous cooling transformation, and I will show you actual experimental data from uh, plate mills. Uh, it's not my data, but uh, um, I'll, I'll acknowledge who provided the data. Where. You get a mixture of ferrite, Wiedmannstadt and ferrite, and perlite. Okay, and then you alter the cooling rate. You get a different mixture, and so on. So Wiedmannstadt and ferrite certainly forms in uh, steels which are hot rolled, but it depends on your chemical composition and thermomechanical processing. If you want to reduce the amount of Wiedmannstadt and ferrite, then you need to reduce the austenite grain size, uh, because what happens is that you form a layer of ferrite at the austenite grain boundaries, and the carbon partitioned uh, retards the Wiedmannstadt and ferrite. Okay, so the ferrite which forms first enriches the austenite and retards the Wiedmannstadt and ferrite transformation. And if you have a small grain size, then for the same thickness of the layer of ferrite, you have a greater amount of enrichment in the middle. So Wiedmannstadt and ferrite tends to occur far more in large austenite grain sizes than in thermomechanically processed, uh, you know, where you have a very fine recrystallized austenite grain size or even pancaked austenite. Uh, again, I will cover this in a later lecture after we have dealt with ferrite and perlite because it's a very important question. Now, in general, uh, and, and, you know, you have to look at your particular case. So if, if you're steel, as a very low carbon concentration, then the toughness will be very high. And then it doesn't matter if you've got Wiedmann and ferrite. But uh, in, say, a 0.1 carbon or 0.2 carbon steel, such as those that you use for making uh, I beams and so on, uh, having Wiedmann and ferrite would reduce the toughness okay? because uh, you're presenting a large crystallographic grain size. That is uh, what I explained at the beginning of the lecture. So it does depend on what application you're dealing with and uh, uh, you know, what is the exact composition of the steel. But in welding alloys, it's well known, very well known, that you must avoid it to optimize toughness. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Then I am particularly pleased to say that there is another question from Italy from Francesca Maurig, ABSHI. Please, Francesca. Hello, good afternoon, Professor Babadesha. Thank you for your lesson. So mine is more, uh, let's say, a remark than, uh, than a question. So I'm very pleased and interested and looking forward to uh, your next lesson about uh, when uh, you will explain how 
uh, let's say to avoid uh, Wittmannstaten because we have some applications where we are required to form a Wittmannstaten uh, uh, structure and therefore I would be very, very interested in, in understanding how we can control uh, our, uh, let's say, process in order to promote uh, the formation of the structure. Okay, okay. So in medium uh, carbon uh, grades uh, with some, let's say, manganese and chromium, we are required to provide that kind of, uh, of structure. And therefore, uh, sometimes we have troubles uh, in achieving it. <laughs> so that's very interesting. So what is the sort of application? Well, the ap application is for, uh, let's say, agricultural vehicles. It's for some kind of axles uh, for uh, tractors uh, and uh, agricultural uh, vehicles. And therefore, uh, Yes, in this specific kind of grade, we are required to uh, provide this kind of uh, microstructure. Okay, that's very interesting. Uh, I've never heard of that before, so I look forward to learning really? more. Yes. If you can, uh, I mean, is it possible for you to send me uh, an article or something like that? Absolutely. I will do that. Uh, I'm very pleased uh, to do that. Okay. Excellent.